In this video, I'm gonna show you some basic color mixing principles made easy and how I painted this landscape using only red, yellow, blue, and white. Stick around, this video is gonna be fun. Hi, Sam here, thanks for tuning in. Now, the subject of color theory. It can seem a bit daunting and a bit of a dry subject, but trust me, just learning a couple of principles about color and value can really help improve your artwork. And to be honest, I wish I'd learned this right from the get-go, because I honestly think I'd be much more ahead of the game. But hey, it's all good. So, in this video, I'm just gonna show you a couple of basic principles about color mixing and value, and this is particularly suitable for beginners. But even if you're an experienced painter, you're still gonna enjoy this video, I reckon, because for the rest of it, I'm gonna show you how I created this landscape using only three colors, red, yellow, blue, and white. It's actually the same scene that I painted in my previous video on mixing greens, and I wanted to see if I could recreate that painting again, but just using three primary colors and white. So stick around, it's gonna be interesting. As always, there's some written notes that accompany this video, so just click the link below. And if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you've not already done so. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Let's roll the tape. So here I've got a simplified colour wheel which I've mixed on my palette. And it consists of three primary colours, red, blue and yellow, and three secondary colours, so green, orange and violet. So when we mix blue and yellow together we get green, when we mix yellow and red together we get orange, and when we mix blue and red together we get violet. When these colours are arranged in the colour wheel, the primary colours are opposite the secondary colours. And these colours that are across from each other are known as complements or complementary opposites. So blue is opposite to orange, red is opposite to green, and yellow is opposite to violet. So why is this important to know? Well, for one main reason, when you're mixing a colour on your palette and you need to desaturate the colour, you can do this by mixing its complementary opposite. When you mix two complementary opposites together, you can create some browns or neutral greys, especially when combined with white. So for example, when I combine ultramarine blue with cadmium orange, its colour opposite, it creates a very dark brown. And when I add some titanium white to the mix, it creates a bluish grey colour. So this is very useful for creating some of those neutral colours that you find in nature, such as in rocks for example. Complementary opposites can look good next to each other in a painting if done correctly. And if you look closely in nature, you'll see colour complements everywhere. So for example in this painting I've added a bit of a red element into the grass which adds some harmony to the painting. Next I'd just like to briefly talk about value and value is how light or dark a colour is and is probably one of the most important things in creating a successful painting. Value is often represented on a value scale, with light at one end and dark at the other, and then the rest in the middle are mid-tones. Getting your values right is especially important in landscape painting in order to achieve atmospheric depth. In general, you'll find your darkest darks and your lightest lights in the foreground, as the full range of the value scale is used. But as landforms recede into the distance, darks are not quite dark and lights are not quite light, as the value scale narrows. If you're painting from photos and you're unsure where your lights and darks are, just take your photo and switch it to black and white. Then you'll clearly be able to see where your dark and light values are. Remember that colours have values too, and it'll influence the lights and darks in your painting depending on what colours you mix together. 
For example, if we take this simplified color wheel and switch it to black and white, you'll see that yellow is the lightest value, whilst the violet and blue are the darkest values. Anyway, that's some basic colour theory out of the way, and hopefully you're not too bored and haven't switched on to the next video. So, for the rest of the video, we're going to kick it up a notch and put some of that colour theory into practice. Now, for those of you that watched my previous YouTube video on mixing greens, we'll see that I painted a landscape that featured some trees and lots of green rolling hills. And for this painting, I used my normal palette. But after I published the video, I thought, why don't I see if I can recreate the same painting again using only three primary colours, red, yellow and blue, and titanium white. Can it be done? Well, let's find out what happened. So here is my paint palette, and the row of colours along the top are the colours that I normally use at the moment. So the colours I use include Titanium White, Burnt Sienna, Yellow Oxide, Cadmium Yellow, Cadmium Orange, Quinacridone Crimson, Ultramarine Blue and Thalo Green. Aside from the yellow and blue, I'm going to see if I can mix the rest of the colours using Cadmium Yellow, Cadmium Red, Ultramarine Blue and Titanium White. Let's see how we go. I'll start with an easy colour first, orange, which is yellow and red mixed together. If it's still looking a bit too yellow, I can add some more red into the mix. The next colour I make is Crimson, which I mix using Ultramarine Blue and Cadmium Red. This colour is a bit tricky to make as you have to get the balance just right. My homemade Crimson isn't quite the same, but close enough. It also doesn't pack the same punch that the Quinacridone Crimson does but it's still going to be good enough to use in the painting. Right, next, let's see if I can make a thalo green. Thalo green is a dark emerald green, and in order to mix this, I start with ultramarine blue, and I mix in a little cadmium yellow. I'm trying to keep the value of the green darker by using more ultramarine blue. And whilst it's not exact, I reckon it's pretty close. So that's the easy colours out of the way, now for the tricky ones. Mixing yellow oxide and burnt sienna. Yellow oxide is similar to yellow ochre but just a tiny bit punchier. I start to make this colour by mixing cadmium yellow and ultramarine blue, which makes green. And then I add some cadmium red. The red, which is the complementary opposite to green on the colour wheel, has neutralised it and made a brown. So this is already a good base to work from. I can see that the colour needs some more yellow in the mixture, so I add in some more cadmium yellow. And this also lightens the value of the colour. The value is still looking a bit dark and it's still a little bit too saturated, so I mix in some titanium white, which further desaturates the colour. Now I accidentally added in a bit too much white, so then I added some more cadmium yellow and cadmium red, just to bring that colour back up. So again, not quite the same, but pretty darn close. And now finally the last colour on my palette, Burnt Sienna, which was a little tricky to make. I start by using cadmium red, and then I mix some ultramarine blue. The colour is already similar to the crimson that I made earlier. 
But in order to achieve that more rusty tone, I add in a little cadmium yellow. Now as I was mixing this, I added in a bit too much cadmium yellow which lightened the value so I had to readjust the mixture by adding in some more ultramarine blue and cadmium red. But as with all the other colours I've made, whilst it's not quite the same, it's pretty close. And these are all colours I can work with to start my painting. I'm painting on an 8x10 linen panel and these are great for small paintings and for plein air paintings. They're made by a company in the USA and I've put a link in the description below. I've sketched out my composition and then I start the painting by adding in my darkest values and shadows first. I'm using a number 6 brush and I start by painting the cloud shadows. I mix a combination of ultramarine blue and homemade burnt sienna which desaturates the blue. I then also mix in a little homemade crimson and some titanium white. Then next I paint the distant trees on the hill and I'm using the same colour combination but with less titanium white so the value is darker. I start blocking in the trees in the midground, and as they're closer to the viewer and also the fact that I'm painting the background in shadow, it's going to be darker in value. So I mix a combination of ultramarine blue and homemade yellow ochre which creates a green and then I desaturate the colour and darken the value by adding in some burnt sienna. The red in the burnt sienna being opposite to the green that I've just made. I also add a small amount of titanium white in the mix just to make the value lighter. The shadows in the pine trees are the darkest values in the painting as they are closest to the viewer. And again I use the same colour that I used for the trees in the midground but with no titanium white. Then next I start painting the shadows in the grass which is a combination of ultramarine blue with yellow ochre and a little crimson and titanium white to lighten the value. As the distant fields are in shadow, I paint these also before I paint anything that's in light. Grass is naturally lighter in value than trees, so this must be communicated in the painting. I mix the colours for the grass with a combination of ultramarine blue and some yellow ochre. Then I mix in a little bit of crimson and titanium white to make the value lighter. As the grass is in shadow I want to keep that green cooler so I don't use too much yellow ochre in the mix. So now I have all my dark values and shadows in place. Personally, I prefer to paint this way as I find it much easier to then add the areas in light and it also makes it easier to get the saturation of the colour correct. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. Many other artists paint in a different manner, but this is what works for me. I think by establishing all your dark values first that you create a solid base to work from and it makes it much easier to establish a tonal dynamic in your painting to create that atmospheric depth. Now that I've roughly established all my shadows, I'm going to start painting the areas in light. And I start with the clouds. I paint the cloud highlights with a combination of titanium white mixed with homemade burnt sienna. I also mix some of this white into the cloud shadows to create texture within the clouds. I paint the sky using a combination of titanium white, ultramarine blue and a bit of homemade phthalo green. I then start adding more of my cloud shadow mix to the clouds, blending the colours and starting to form their shapes. I make a start on painting the foliage in the pine trees. Pine tree foliage is quite dark in value, so I need to mix a dark green. 
and I do this by mixing ultramarine blue and yellow ochre to start with. But then I lighten the value and increase the saturation of the colour a little by adding in some cadmium yellow. I then harmonise that green and make it look more natural by adding in some colours that contain its colour complement which is red. So in this case I add in some homemade orange and some homemade crimson into the mix. I use my cloud shadow mix to mix the water in the pond by the trees. I use the same colours for the grass as I did in the pine trees, but I use much more cadmium yellow which not only lightens the value but it increases the saturation. I also add titanium white in order to make the value lighter. I can green up the grass a little by adding some homemade thalo green. But if the green's looking a bit too cold, I can warm it up by adding in some orange and crimson. I also find that adding in a little yellow ochre helps to make that grass softer. The blocking in stage of this painting is nearly complete. Now when you're creating a painting, I always think it's best to try and get the blocking in stage done in one go. And that way you can quickly assess whether your colours and values and tonal dynamic in general is going to work in the painting. It's much easier to make changes and colour and tonal adjustments at this stage than having to rework a painting later on when you've added a load of detail. That can be pretty frustrating. So the blocking in stage should provide sufficient information to let you know whether your painting reads well and whether you've created a solid base to work from where you can start adding detail. Now for the remainder of the painting I'm adding detail and I'll just briefly talk about my approach towards this and also some advantages and disadvantages of using a limited palette. Don't forget you can check out my previous video on mixing greens to see how I painted this artwork in more detail and of course using my normal palette. Whenever I block in a painting I always keep the values a little darker so I've got plenty of room to add lighter tone later on in the painting. And then I'll be saving my lightest values until the end of the painting. As I start adding more detail to the painting I make value adjustments along the way. So for example here I made the trees in the distance lighter as well as the grass. I also added some more saturated green to the midground trees but making sure that the value was still the same as the previous layer. When it comes to painting the trees and the grass, I'm adding lighter layers with each pass to build up that three dimensional form. So now let's talk about the advantages of just using red, yellow, blue and white. So one of the obvious things is that just using three colours will help you to improve your colour mixing skills and give you a better understanding of how colour works. But the other main advantage to using such a limited palette is you're more likely to achieve colour harmony in your painting. Paintings are more harmonious when there's common elements throughout. So if you're just using three colours there's a strong chance you're going to be using those three colours all the way through the painting. Whereas if you're using lots of different pre-mixed colours, there is a risk that those colours won't be so cohesive and your painting might just look a little off all round. Some artists throughout history and even to the modern day have used a limited palette. And one of the most famous historical painters to use such a palette was the Swedish painter Anders Zorn. He's known for his figurative paintings and portraits and he only used four colours on his palette which included yellow ochre, vermilion, ivory black and titanium white. This is referred to as the Zorn palette. The disadvantage of just using these three colours is that you may miss out on beneficial attributes of certain tube colours. For example, phthalo green has a high tinting strength, 
whereas my homemade phthalo green just didn't have the same covering power. After adding the final details to my painting, it was time to put it to the test and compare it to the original one. I think they look pretty close. Can you tell the difference between the two? Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to learn more about painting, check out my website, I've put the link below. But there's a whole load of painting resources on there including my painting blog and I also have a full length painting video on there on how to paint a mountain valley so check that out as well. If you've got any comments or questions about painting or you've got any suggestions for future videos please leave them in the comments section below and I shall answer them. You can also follow me online including Instagram, Facebook and Pinterest so you can see me there. But anyway, till next time I'll see you in the next video. Happy painting!